Hello, everybody. My name is Catalin Kiritescu. Uh, let me just hide a few things in here. I hope everybody can see the full screen. I'm with a company called Fioptics, as Simon said, and I'm the uh, lead product developer at Fioptics. Uh, today's subject is labeled free quantitative phase imaging of live cells and tissues. And uh, I want to thank you all for your uh, time and looking forward to your questions towards the end. I want to start with everybody's question, I guess, on everybody's mind. What is quantitative phase imaging? Um, and in short, is a method to measure optical path length changes in a sample. Um, that's the uh, short description of it. And just to illustrate this idea, if we look at the schematic on the left, um, if you have an object, let's say a cell of refractive index N in a medium N naught, it will introduce an optical path length change in um, or a phase shift proportional to the refractive index in the thickness of the sample when a light uh, beam passes through it as opposed to a beam passing through the medium of refractive index and not. So this difference between the two beams, the uh, reference beam, the one that passes outside the cell and the sample beam, the one passing through the cell, it's called the phase shift and is what QPI in general measures. QPI or quantitative phase imaging is an umbrella term for a lot of, uh, well, a number of techniques, including the ones that Fioptics is integrating in uh, our instruments. Uh, to name a few will be spatial light interference microscopy, gradient light interference microscopy, these two from Fioptics, digital holography, um, holotomography and a number of other techniques that are out there. Uh, they all have in common, like I mentioned, measuring optical path length changes in a sample. And this image on the right illustrates this, this very well. Uh, the heat map here is a measurement of the uh, optical path length changes to the sample and it shows uh, cell culture with one particular cell uh, close to mitosis. Um, and the uh, more red areas are the areas that have a higher optical path length change. The more blue areas are the ones that have less optical path length change. So areas that have more material like the nucleus um, will, will generate a higher optical path length change as opposed to the membrane or the uh, medium surrounding the cell that will have uh, no change. So uh, in general, generally speaking, uh, optical this uh, phase shift is proportional to the refractive index and, and not in the height of the sample. So with knowledge about the refractive index, delta N, um, one can measure the topography of the sample. With knowledge about the uh, height or the topography of the sample, one can do refractometry. And I will focus today, of course, on the instruments and the techniques that we are uh, bringing to the market, uh, slim and glim and emphasize these, uh, the properties of these uh, methods that, uh, that apply in this case. SLIM stands for Spatial Light Interference Microscopy, is a method that um, is implemented, uh, as I mentioned before, or as Simon mentioned before, as an add-on to an optical microscope, to an inverted research-grade optical microscope. From the get-go, I would like to say that Phioptics has thought to implement, as we, um, as we discussed before, uh, to implement these modules as an add-on to existing microscopes. Because of the need to have two beams, a reference beam and a sample beam, the easiest way to do this through an optical microscope is to use the existing optical paths through it. In addition to that, you know, we, um, we're using the existing infrastructure. Every biologist out there will have access to a microscope so that's an easier way to access um, quantitative phase imaging techniques. In this case, the spatial light interference microscopy method uses a phase contrast microscope. In a phase contrast microscope, there are two optical paths that characterize two different beams. Um, these beams are geometrically separated from the uh, collector, from the condenser, where you have an, uh, an analyst that has the shape of a ring, that analyst generates uh, 
an illumination path in the shape of a ring that passes through the specimen, through the sample and the medium surrounding it, and then is focused in the back focal plane of the microscope objective. There, there's a phase mask or a phase plate that uh, through which all that looks very much like the analyst, uh, through which all the diffracted or scattered light will pass through. So the outside of the ring will, will, be, will be filled with light that passed through the sample itself, so it's scattered. The light that passes through the ring, through the phase ring itself, will be the light that has come out uh, unscattered. So you have two separate beams, a sample beam and a reference beam, that then will be, um, that then interfere in the image plane and form the well-known uh, um, interference patterns. So you have constructive and destructive interference resulting a contrast image. We, uh, with our modules, with our SLIM module, we connect to the camera port of the microscope and then um, the SLIM module works as a relay, a one-to-one -one relay from the uh, camera port to the uh, camera attached to the output of the, uh, of the SLIM module. So it, uh, it converts the image from the camera port to the camera uh, itself uh, undisturbed. In the middle of the SLIM module, there is a spatial light modulator. Its function is to um, work as a variable face plate. So you have that face plate in the back focal plane of the microscope objective that imparts only a, a fixed phase shift to the light coming from the microscope. What the um, spatial light modulator does is imparts an additional phase shift uh, that is controllable. So we, we uh, generate a mask, uh, a ring mask on the spatial light modulator that overlaps with the uh, illumination image of the analyst and then it imparts additional phase uh, shifts to the light. The resulting images that you can see in here, so you have the image without any phase shift applied to it or with a phase shift applied by the uh, microscope objective, then an additional pi over two and another pi over two and another pi over two. Four images, the reason for taking four images is because the uh, transport equations are basically four equations with four unknowns. With, uh, we take four images and then we acquire these intensity images. What they have, these images have in common the same incoherent background, but the different coherent contributions. So subtracting the two pairs of images from each other, we only select the coherent component and subtract out the multiple scattering con contribution. The end result is a uniquely defined uh, phase image where the intensity in every pixel is the optical path length change to the sample, as illustrated by this, uh, by this image here. Um, I want to compare this with classical phase shifting methods. Uh, and in, case of, in the case of SLIM, the classical comparison is with phase contrast. Phase contrast is also a phase shifting method that has been uh, developed in the 1930s. Zernike got a Nobel Prize for it. The difference between phase contrast and SLIM is that SLIM is a quantitative method, meaning that is um, repeatable and accurate measurement of the actual phase shift to the sample. While the phase contrast technique is, all right, the phase contrast technique is uh, just a qualitative aspect, it's just a qualitative um, description of the sample itself. In addition to the difference between qualitative and quantitative, You'll notice in this image of, um, in this case, there are microtubules. You'll notice that uh, the uh, SLIM has a higher signal to noise ratio with respect to, to phase contrast, which allows it to actually image with a higher accuracy uh, objects as small as, in this case, for example, 20 nanometers in diameter. Moving forward, uh, SLIM, Although it's a label-free method, meaning that it doesn't need a fluorescence marker in order to generate an image, as opposed to, for example, fluorescence, it will, um, it will sti it's still complementary to fluorescence imaging. So fluorescence imaging has its place. We're not looking to uh, displace that anytime soon, but it 
is complementary in the sense that while fluorescence will eventually, the fluorescence signal, as you see in here, will eventually photo bleach and disappear, so you have to wait for it. The um, slim signal continues, you know, for as long as the, the sample is present in there and is alive, if we're talking about live cells. So it will continue to image like this for weeks if needed. A very common way that our customers, for example, are using uh, SLIM is to acquire, for example, for days at a time or 24 hours, a cell cycle at a time, with, uh, with the fluorescent signal acquired every, let's say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, just for co-localization co purposes. Gradient light interference microscopy is the second technique that I wanted to talk about today. Just like SLIM, it also benefits from a two-path, two-beam uh, geometry. In this case, from the two-beam geometry coming from the diffraction, from the DIC, uh, DIC microscope, so diffraction interference contrast, uh, differential interference contrast. Um, in DIC, you also have two identical power cross-polarized beams that are shifted by the condenser prism, the Wollaston prism, with a distance smaller than the diffraction spot. After they pass through the sample, the second Wollaston prism will uh, bring the, the beams together and they are sent outside of the microscope without passing it through the last component, typical component of the DIC, which is the analyzer. Uh, again, as the GLIM module is a one-to-one -one relay from the camera port to the, um, to the camera attached to the outside of the, micro, of the GLIM module. In this case, the um, modulation or the, the pi over 2 pi and 3 pi over 2 are applied by um, retarding the phase in multiples of pi over 2 radians on the beam that is aligned to the polarization direction of the spatial light modulator. Uh, controlling the phase shift between these two beams, we acquire again multiple images, 0 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, and pi, uh, and then subtract the two pairs of the, the images in, in pairs, one from each other, to select only the coherent component and subtract out the multiple scattering contribution. The, the biggest difference between GLIM and SLIM is that in GLIM, the two imaging beams are always equal in power. They always go through the specimen with the same power as opposed to the SLIM, which in the phase contrast uh, optical path, the sample beam, I'm sorry, the reference beam will always have a lower, in, will have a lower power than the sample beam. So you'll see a little bit later that that causes in highly scattering objects, that will cause a loss of contrast. In GLIM, that doesn't happen. Both beams have equal power. They suffer equal degradation to the, due to the multiple scattering. So they interfere with high contrast, um, even in optically, very optically thick specimens. And that is illustrated very nice here in this image, a comparison with a typical DIC image of an acute mouse brain slice. So brain slice of something like um, 200, 300 nanometers thick. You'll notice an increase in the contrast in the GLIM as opposed to the SLIM at equally uh, when the microscope objective and the condenser have the, the largest NA. A few um, specs about the systems. One is spatial resolution. Um, in X and Y, the systems are both diffraction limited. So we're talking about 200 nanometers. They are wide field techniques, not confocal. Um, in the Z, the resolution is on the order of about 900 nanometers for a, a numerical aperture of 1.4 NA. Um, this re Z resolution is dictated by two effects. One is broadband illumination. The illumination that is used for imaging is white light. And the second one is the numerical aperture of the objective, which gives you a depth of focus gating. Be together, they generate, uh, they, they lend to the slim and glim techniques their optical, section proper, opt optical sectioning properties, meaning that imaging at every time is done through a slice of the sample. That is then, so that focus plane through the sample that is then carried over to the camera. 
and that allows one, for example, to do slim and glim tomography. That's another um, important aspect. The other important aspect is the fact that uh, using this broadband illumination, the white light, which has a which has a coherence length of about a micron or so, results in uh, avoids the presence of speckles that usually plague uh, laser-based uh, illumination techniques. Face sensitivity is the other uh, important characteristic of both slim and glim. Because the sample and the reference beam both go to the same optical path through in the slim and glim module, the, uh, nan the, the, the images, the resulting images have a nanometer face sensitivity meaning a very flat background. And this is an example here of measuring the optical path length noise level. So they have a very low noise in a background image, so like a piece of glass with no sample on it. And you notice that the noise on is on the, on the order of about a nanometer. In, in a very clean microscope, uh, I give you that, in a very clean piece of glass. But nevertheless, you can get very good um, face sensitivity which means that uh, coming back to the Z resolution, within a optic, an optical slice of 900 nanometers, uh, we can actually detect if, for example, uh, we have a sample in there that is uh, thinner than 900 nanometers and it changes its dimensions, in particular its Z dimension, so its thickness. If it changes its thickness by as low as a nanometer or so, we can actually detect that change in term, in um, in the phase signal, and it can be measured. That allows uh, the user, for example, to measure or, det or detect uh, objects smaller than the diffraction limit. In that case, like you saw before, um, microtubules, which are objects that are you know, 20, 30 nanometers in diameter. Refractometry is the other um, thing that can be done with the, um, with the op quantity phase imaging techniques with the known um, dimensions, we known Z dimension for the sample that is acquired typically by doing a Z stack. Uh, you can detect, you can determine the, refract, the refractive index and thus generate a refractive index map of the specimen. In this case, a, um, a cancer cell where the refractive index of the nucleus can be segmented and then separated from the refractive index of the membrane of the cytoplasm and thus um, generate a refractive index uh, image. What's, um, what's interesting about uh, slim and glim is that the, uh, because of the white field characteristic of these two techniques, um, this refractometry is done in the entire field of view. So if you have a four megapixel image, you can do a Z-stack that is four megapixel wide and then um, reconstruct of the entire Z-stack over the entire field of view. And finally, another important aspect is the measurement of dry mass. Uh, a number of studies starting in the 50s have shown that the phase uh, measurements are directly, or the phase shift to a sample is directly proportional to a coefficient called uh, refractive index increment, or DN to DC, uh, which has been studied and shown that for essentially uh, the majority of components in a cell is a constant across the entire um, wavelength, uh, wavelength range. So then, the refract, uh, known, knowing the phase of a, in a sample, for example, we can easily convert that map into a dry mass map, meaning content of the cell that is not water. And uh, the sensitivity in, in the phase for uh, slim and glim, which is about a milliradian, converts into a sensitivity to dry mass of about a femtogram. So in this case, as it was shown in uh, numerous papers, you can weigh a single cell um, if you choose that as your uh, ROI, or you can weigh a number of cells or a population of cells uh, if that is selected. In summary, or generally speaking, um, these are the things that, um, of the, these are the value uh, values that a slim and a glim technique will bring to you. First of all, real-time continuous and quantitative imaging, either 2D cell cultures where slim um, 
excels or 3D cell cultures like spheroids where GLIM uh, excels. And the measurements are, as I mentioned before, 3D morphology, you can measure the dry mass, you can measure refractive index changes. Long-term investigation, uh, I mentioned continuous before, this can be done over from seconds to all the way to weeks, of course, you need an incubator uh, surrounding the microscope. And this can be, these investigations can be done in various assays. Viability, cytotoxicity, growth and proliferation, senescence, wound healing, anything that has to do with cell dynamics, essentially. Um, I mentioned before that we started from the beginning in developing these techniques in an instrument, into a commercial instrument by choosing a modular geometry. It connects to the camera port of the microscope. It uses the optical pads, either the face contrast or the DIC pads of the microscope objectives, and it can upgrade uh, a microscope from either Zeiss, Nikon, Leica, Olympus, so the big four on the market. And another interesting aspect is that the same camera is used for all microscope channels. So everything that comes out of the, the microscope, either fluorescence, bright field, face contrast, DIC, can be seamlessly overlaid with the slim channel. And you'll see a few examples later. Our, <clears throat> we developed a very nimble and powerful uh, automated 4D acquisition software called Cell Vista that allows you to uh, scan in 3D, do time series, so you get a 4D acquisition, basically, of any samples. The resulting files are 32-bit TIFF files uh, that, uh, at full camera resolution, we typically um, deliver these systems with an Orca Flash or an Andor Zyla or a BSI Prime 95. Um, at full resolution, they run at about 12 frames per second. Of course, the typical channels of the microscope uh, can be acquired at full camera speed, so up to, say, 100 frames per second when using a camera link uh, camera for the typical fluorescence, bright field, face contrast, DIC. <clears throat> the seamless overlay, as I mentioned before. Analysis is done using widely available and um, software called uh, ImageJ, Fiji, so things that uh, people are, uh, researchers in general, are familiar with. And we're using plugins to calculate the 3D volume of a sample, the dry mass, the refractive index maps. All these are easily uh, calculated from the, uh, from the phase map that the system generates. And I wanted to also mention that for long-term imaging, the uh, software benefits from a software autofocus. And I can get into some details for the people that are interested uh, outside of the of the of this webinar um, about how this how this works minimal sample preparation samples can be imaged in 35 millimeter cell dishes all the way up to 384 well plates um, and slim and glim both take advantage of the full camera resolution imaging they can be multiplexed with fluorescence channels 3d tomography as i mentioned before uh, and just as I mentioned also before, the, they both excel at different camera lengths. So they're complementary to each other. I will go now quickly through a number of applications that we've, that we've uh, at the company done, we've seen in the field with our customers. Uh, many of these have been published already and you'll see where applicable the, uh, the paper where the results have been published. Uh, feel free to reach out to AXD, uh, to us, uh, for more papers and uh, references about these. I mentioned before uh, SLIM as being optimal for uh, imaging cell culture. So we're talking about monolayers, maybe two layers of cells, bacterial biofilms, um, tissue biopsies, and also another new application that uh, has recently come on our radar is protein aggregates for um, in more biopharma industry applications. GLIM is taking uh, these measurements to the next step in terms of size range. Um, it's more, uh, it's optimal for um, imaging embryos, organoids, brain slices, larger, op more optically thick in vitro specimens. I'll start with 
the smaller scale. We'll start from small to large. Uh, protein particles. I mentioned a, a darling of the biopharma uh, industry. These proteins are used to generate various drug treatments, and we can characterize with high throughput um, protein aggregates in various concentrations and various um, molecular masses. Uh, advanced particle statistics are available, and also for the uh, research inclined scientists at the biopharma companies, um, the system, of course, it can generate 3D tomograms so that they can, for example, look at the nature of construction of protein aggregates. Um, we, you can start by monitoring, for example, the growth of single cells. In this case, for example, E. coli. This is, a, uh, this is an imaging of E. coli over a period of time. As soon as it starts budding and forming the daughter cells, the mass can be tracked and measured separately and segmented. This can be done also in a cell population and generate statistics over the entire population. And of course, um, the uh, 3D tomography or 3D uh, reconstruction of, of samples is important and uh, it can be done uh, starting from the single cell all the way to um, multi-cell or all the way to uh, mammalian samples. This is another example of uh, bacterial imaging and uh, reconstructing a 3D profile for this. this in this particular case, it was shown just for one particular bacteria or group of bacteria. But this, like I mentioned before, it can be done for the entire field of view. So you can get a 3D profile of the entire field of view. You can multiplex slim with fluorescence. And here, blue channel is slim. Uh, and red and green are respectively um, Rx and um, GFP tagged uh, bacteria. So two families of bacteria, you notice that slim channel actually can visualize all the bacteria present in the culture, and then you can use the fluorescence channel, for example, as a segmentation, as a mask, to segment the different uh, families of uh, bacteria in there. This can be done also using GLIM in a thicker specimen, in this case, in bacteria biofilms. Uh, this was a sample collected off of a, uh, it's a dental pluck. And uh, again, bacteria are easily visible and um, can be, uh, their dynamics can be measured with GLIM and use the fluorescence channel for colonization. More uh, information about bacteria is this one just to illustrate how to use, how to determine the to get refractive index maps and how to use that refractive index change to identify different kinds of bacteria uh, as an alternative, for example, to fluorescence tagging. We're moving on to larger uh, specimens. So we're talking about now uh, about mammalian cells, so cancer cells, bone osteosarcoma, bone cancer cell. Uh, and where you can where you can see small features within the cell, uh, starting with the nucleolides and then moving to the ER, Golgi uh, apparatus, and then uh, mitochondria and lipids. Even more examples using rat glia cells. The heat map in here again is indicative of the optical phase shift or the phase shift of the sample uh, phase optical path length change or the phase shift of the sample, higher um, refractive index material that is in the center of the sample or the, the um, uh, lipid droplets found inside the cell will generate a higher signal as opposed to other areas. Cell viability, this is an interesting project that uh, a customer of ours um, has looking at uh, viability of um, Chinese hamster ovary cells, they are the workhorse of many uh, bioreactor applications, and then measuring that, measuring their viability. This can be done with SLIM, and you notice in here um, a, um, an image of a SLIM image of, of a cell, such a cell culture with the cell undergoing its death phases. Um, and at the same time, you can imagine, you can image with GLIM 
the same cells, but uh, in cell aggregates, which is a, a big problem in bioreactor cell like cells like to aggregate and then are harder to, for example, count if you want to do a cell count. So that way you can measure high density 3D aggregated samples um, and then determine the cell viability using, for example, tripan blue exclusion. Again, an example of an application using uh, using uh, a drug treatments and their effects on, in this case, cancer cells. You see the effect of the actual doxorubicin loaded nanoparticles on a culture of cancer cells. And uh, you can easily determine their fate by just, uh, just by um, you know, direct observation. This direct observation is, can then be used to determine you know, the number of viable cells in the, in the culture. Cytotoxicity, again, um, a, a, in this case, cytotoxicity as a principle was tested on a neural network culture where uh, two uh, networks have been, one untreated, the other one treated with a growth inhibitor and uh, to determine the change in the dry mass as a, uh, an indicator of the uh, cell proliferation, cell growth. Uh, in the uh, cytotoxicity in this case. Proliferation, I mentioned before, it can be measured with single cell um, resolution. So you can measure, for example, the, the dry mass of uh, mean dry mass versus time for all the cells in a, in a cell culture and also the dry mass versus time for the entire population, the black um, mark in here. Overlaying with multiple fluorescence channels, very easy uh, and straightforward. In this case, it's overlay between SLIM and GFP, marking mitochondrial activity in CHO cells. Live cell tomography, um, as before, uh, is, in, is uh, facilitated by the optical section and characteristics of both SLIM and GLIM. And combining this with um, time series, you can get a 4D map, for example, of mass transport through a um, neuronal culture. Another kind of samples that are um, widely used, uh, SLIM is widely used to, um, to measure, are tissue microarrays for cancer diagnosis. Um, and you can scan a large number of tissues in these tissue microarrays and then use SLIM or SLIM markers as an indicator for outcome prediction. And um, a number of recent papers have shown that the marker, the SLIM marker actually has a very good prediction power compared to the typical prediction powers for uh, CAPRIAS, for example, which is a typical indicator. Um, combining SLIM with machine learning, then you can, in automatic screening, you can get uh, this whole prediction power on your side and be able, this is still a work in progress and still be, and be able to, for example, make prediction and diagnosis of cancer um, at a later stage. Moving on to larger sizes, embryos. This is where uh, GLIM excels. Uh, in this case, for example, it's a bovine embryo is one of the thickest embryos in nature. They're chock full of lipid droplets and in a typical face contrast or DIC image, this will be just a one giant blob. Um, Glim allows to image inside the embryo with even though you have multiple scattering uh, centers and get uh, a view of the fate of the embryo itself. Same, the 3D tomography can then be used. And for example, in this reconstruction, you, using a mirror, you can get a uh, refractive index map of this particular embryo and its uh, characteristic and you know, the division in multiple uh, cells as it, as it evolves. This can also be applied to uh, stem cells, uh, particularly to, in this case, stem cells that don't take easily to fluorescent signals. Uh, and also moving even higher in uh, dimension in, uh, sizes, we're looking at spheroids. 
So spheroids are these 3D constructs of these cell aggregates, essentially, that um, in their full um, development mimic the behavior or are hoped to mimic the behavior of organs. Um, and Glim allows the user to image through the entire mass of an organoid, in this case, a uh, 250 uh, micron thick organoid based on hep G2 uh, cells, hepatic cancer, um, and be able to uh, see cell outlines to notice uh, cell components within the, within the cell and then study, for example, the evolution of that spheroid over a long period of time, in this case, about 70 hours. Uh, and measure uh, its growth. Radiation effects, the study of, um, of how radiation, for example, affects uh, lymphoma spheroids in this case. Uh, this, can be, this was a recent project with uh, a group at uh, University of Cincinnati, and it shows the effects of radiation uh, on the, uh, these lymphoma spheroids. Another kind of cancer, uh, spheroids, diffuse intrinsic pointing glioma, um, and their structure in terms of um, 3D structure, and their, or, and their final fate. And then we're moving on to microorganisms, such as C. elegans, which you can, with GLIM, uh, you get a glimpse of the uh, internal structure. Uh, moving on to uh, you know different sections through the sample at different heights, you notice the um, with very high quality uh, image and very accurate imaging of the uh, reproductive organs and the rest of the structure of the of the ele of the C elegans. This, of course, can be combined with um, fluorescent signals, for example, to tag individual neurons inside the. The uh, C. elegans worm, which is a very well studied uh, animal, and then re, uh, reconstruct its 3D structure. A uh, relative of the C. elegans, Pristioncus pacificus, this was a sample from Max Black Institute for Developmental Biology, um, Z stacking through a, through a live specimen allows you to reconstruct its 3D structure and notice uh, features of interest. Same thing with the midsection of the of the worm with its um, with with its reproductive organs. Moving on to the zebrafish, in which tomography will show the different structures of liver, heart, and even the flow of uh, of blood to the to the specimen. Or if you're looking at uh, the neural cord, so the uh, the neuron termination of the of the tail of the zebrafish, you can uh, notice the different structures due to the very good optical sectioning of the glim. Brain slices are a great specimen for uh, glim imaging, and in acute brain slices, um, one can measure, for example. The um, one can determine, for example, the different uh, neuronal planes with various magnifications and determine the, the presence of the neuronal planes and also zoom in with a higher magnification and, for example, measure individual neurons and their structure. Uh, on the left for comparison, it's a uh, biocytin filled uh, neuron that has been filled with a dye, which makes it uh, dark in bright field. The same neuron image on the right side, even with the biocytin field, you still see the structure of the neuron in the dendrites uh, with no problems due to the, again, optical, very good optical section. And some more exotic, if you will, specimens, um, plant seedlings and flower buds, uh, these are specimens that usually are hard to image, and uh, many times uh, this, the uh, scientists are forced to to do a lot of mechanical sectioning. In this case, with GLIM, you get access to the entire structure of on the right side of the flower bud and on the seedlings, no problems. 
uh, and even image harder to reach um, portions of the sample, such as seed Mary stem. So the the area where the where the uh, plant starts growing from. And I would like to close my presentation today with a number of selected references. These references are a general description of slim and glim technique. There are much, many more of them, uh, over a hundred papers, <clears throat> when just the uh, quantitative life, uh, the QLI group at UIUC, which has, uh, which is the inventor, Professor Dr. Pro, uh, Gabriel Popescu, the inventor of slim and glim techniques, his group has published of course the most on this but there are many other publications that you can find in the field uh, from other customers uh, with this i would like to thank our uh, host today axt and uh, encourage you to keep in contact with them and with us if you have any other questions <clears throat>